So, I've got, like now, right, it's five? You got 13, no, 515, 13 minutes. So, um, I decided I wanted to come here. I lived in Memphis. I, we, we decided to move here and stay here. I decided I wanted to come here and share all the things I did wrong, all the things I did right. Because, you know, quite honestly, it's more important to know what not to do uh, as much as it is to know what to do. You know, so remember when somebody says you have potential, grill them like a whopper. You want to know what they mean and what you can do to realize that potential. You've got to disrupt the conversation when it comes to how people are generalizing your generation. Remember, they did it to the other ones, but it's your responsibility. There's, you're, there's not going to be a champion. You know, Elon Musk is not running around saying, I want to speak for all of my kind. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> you have to do it one, and you convince people one person at a time that you're willing to put in the work. You're willing to pay your dues. Um, you can't sing the blues unless you pay your dues. Uh, that you're willing to volunteer for things. Your generation has such a, a much stronger sense of community than the generations in front of you. You've got, you've got big issues to tackle. You guys work together great. Uh, you don't, there's not a lot of you who I've encountered who are walking around with hidden agendas. You're not nearly as greedy as generations before you. You want what you want, but you're not gonna stab people in the back to get it. Um, that was my generation, um, the me generation. You know, We all needed to get to our four bedroom houses, three car garages, and you know, put our arms around everything, and my stuff has gotta be better than your stuff. That's not your generation at all. You guys, you guys like brands, though. There are brands that you like. I've noticed there are brands, and that's okay. Brand loyalty and 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 all of that. So you've also got to maintain an open mind. And <coughs> life is hard, man. Wear a helmet. Um, you know you're going to be afraid of things, and when you feel like you're afraid of something, just recognize that you. Just ask yourself, what am I really afraid of? Am I afraid of failing? Okay. Am I afraid? Am I walking around with this imposter syndrome? You know what the imposter syndrome is? Somebody's going to walk up to you and go, hey, you don't know what the fuck you're doing, do you? Right. So um, that doesn't happen. Nobody does that to you. But we sometimes walk around and think that that's going to happen. Each and every one of you... Um, you know, if you, if you have a dream of something you want to do, I don't believe the big groovy gives us the ability to dream something and not be able to attain it. I don't think, I don't think the big groovy plays bait and switch like that. And so, um, you know, and, and um, believe in yourselves. Believe in yourselves. Because, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, you're your biggest champion. You're your biggest champion, and so be bold, be audacious, do shit that, you know, I'm not gonna tell you to do shit that scares you every day, because some of you may be adrenaline junkies, and that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but try to face things and, and recognize that there's no growth in the comfort zone, but there's no comfort in the growth zone. And each and every one of you can do whatever you want, whatever you want. So I think I've got time to answer any questions, if there are any. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you like, get a job with like, when you get right out of college with no experience in the hospitality industry, you have the education, but you don't have the experience. How do you find someone that will take you in and give a chance to you? It's difficult, that's why when you're in school, you should try to jump into the industry so that you've, you know, you've got a little bit on your resume. Or if you're doing anything customer service, you're getting experience, whether you're, you know, waiting on tables or working at a convenience store. That's all customer service, and there's a way to write a resume that shows that. The other thing is networking. 
right, is um, they don't have a class in here on networking. Maybe they do, I'm not aware of it, but in one of my classes, we go through the top 10 rules of networking, how to network, what to get out of it, because the old adage, it's not always what you know, but who you know, that helps. And so when you have guest speakers come into your class, I think we have a couple come into our class. When they come into your classes, you know, hook up with them on LinkedIn and tell them, hey, you were in my class, I'm interested in that business. Um, be memorable in that sense. So if you don't have the experience, at least you'll have some contacts. But the, you know, the only thing I can say is what somebody said to me was go work in this business and see if you like it. Um, and practice interviewing. Practice interviewing and know what you want to say. Have your own elevator speech, right? As cliche as that sounds and trite, it's the truth. Because you're going to be faced with people who are super busy and don't have a lot of time to get to know you. So you have to be able to clearly and with intention tell them who you are, what you're all about, and what you want to do um, in a very short period of time and be good at it. It's a great question. Yes? What do you think the biggest flaw in the hotel industry is? <clears throat> I think it is um, twofold. I think it's um, we're over relying on some technology and it's taking away some of the genuine hospitality that is what our business is all about. You know, I use the example you can check in by phone. You can use your phone turns into your room key. I can order room service. So the human interaction piece is slowly eroding. And we only then have human interaction in our hotels when what? When something goes wrong. And that's not the best way to start relationships. So my concern has been, and I was very vocal about this when I was in Hilton, was that we need to pump the brakes a little bit on some of this technology because this technology is going to be great for you guys, right? You're adept at it, but there's still a tremendous, like I said, there's a big part of the traveling public that's never going to use any of that. And so hotel companies today are investing a lot of money in technology. I get it. And we need to invest more in our people and teach them customer service because consumers' expectations continue to grow, right? Because we all look at Yelp and TripAdvisor and we're looking at reviews and pictures other customers are taking. So by the time we get to our destination, we've got a pretty healthy expectation of what I want. And if we don't have the people at our hotels to deliver the kind of service you expect, because we also have a lot of people who are coming into our workforce who have never experienced good service themselves. So how can you deliver good service when you haven't experienced it? And so I think we need to invest just as much money into our people as we are into the technology. Um, because every time, all of you probably have a favorite restaurant, right? And uh, if you do, I'm sure a big part of why you go there time and time again is you dig the people. They treat you right, they treat you with respect, they know your name, they know what you order. Um, all of those things. And if you don't have a place like that now, you certainly will. And it'll be the people who make the difference for you. So whether it's a flaw, it's a concern, service and technology are, I don't think we're overbuilding. I don't think we're, um, you know, getting too nichey, any of those things. I, I think it's, because it's all the same, right? The hotel business is simple, guys. Right? We keep our hotels looking like new, we, keep, we exceed our guests' expectations, and then we collect the cash appropriately. And that's it. Right? We overcomplicate it with a lot of things. But as long as you bear that in mind, you'll, you're on your way to being a great innkeeper. What else for Frank? I have a question. Like, when you check that box, um relocation you have like loved ones or a spouse or something that lives in a certain area how do you how do you deal with that with having to relocate all the time well first of all they have to 
Um, they have to ask you to relocate, which usually doesn't happen right away. Um, but, you know, that's something whoever it is you're involved with, whether it's a, a loved one, a family member, hey, I'm in, I'm in the hospitality business. This is a business that's going to move me around. You'll, they love you. They're going to come visit you and you'll come back. Nothing's, nothing's permanent. Um, so, you know, I, you just have to be prepared. The only real relocation sentence you get is if you decide, you, if they ask you to go work on an island, like if you're going to go work in the Bahamas, the Caribbean, for an American company, you have to sign typically a two-year personal services contract because island fever is a real thing. And after six to eight months, I opened a hotel uh, down in Grand Cayman, and they offered me a two-year gig there. And after six months, I, I didn't sign the two-year gig. I couldn't wait to get home after six months getting this hotel open. Um, hard to believe, but it's a, it's a real thing. Um, so that's the only real relocation. You just have to prepare the people in your life. Hey, I'm working for a company. I have a friend who just took a job with Amazon. Right, and um, he's going to be traveling, and he'd never had a gig that made him travel before. So he was asking me, "How do you deal with your family when you're traveling? How do you maintain contact? How do you do all?" That? I've been married to the same woman for 33 years. I think a big part of that was because I was on the road a lot. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let's hear it for Frank.